what's remarkable about what happened is you have God himself, the word made flesh, whose body was broken for our benefit and well-being. His hands were pierced with nails and his feet were pierced with nails. He had a crown of thorns on his head. His back was full of lashes as he was beaten. His side was pierced with a spear. But then, of course, Sunday morning, God took his broken body and he raised it to life again that the tomb might be empty, that the tomb might be a sign of his glorious resurrection, and he made that broken body into something beautiful. Christ is risen. (laughs) Hallelujah. You know, God has a tendency to take broken things and turn them into beautiful things. I found a, a great story that actually happened uh, last Easter, so one year ago, at a church uh, called Westminster Church of Detroit. You see, the the pastor was uh, giving his message on Easter Sunday, and when it was over, he had uh, the maintenance guy kind of come up at the end of the service and tug on his shirt and and say, Pastor, we've had a break-in. Somebody came and smashed one of our stained glass windows in our fellowship hall. So after the service, he went and investigated this, and he looked on the ground. He saw little pieces of this beautiful window that had been broken. And so he began to look around to see maybe what was taken, what was the motive for this person breaking in on Easter Sunday. Well, he saw that they had some expensive utensils that were still there, some silverware. He saw that they had some uh, small appliances that could have been taken that were uh, kind of expensive. They were all still in their place. But what he found missing was food, from the refrigerator, food from the pantry and from the freezer was all that they took. So at the next elder meeting then, the pastor met with his elders and they were trying to talk about what they should do about this. And some of the elders said, well, we need to get more secure windows. Another one said, well, we need to get cameras so that we can uh, monitor everything going on in the campus at all times. And the pastor was thinking there and, and he said, maybe the problem isn't our lack of security in this case. Maybe the problem was that this person was hungry. Maybe we could take something that's broken and do something that God would want us to do with that food, and that is give it to those who are in need. So instead of just repairing that broken stained glass window, they actually put in a pass-through window, sliding pass-through window, so that people who were hungry could come and receive bag lunches and also food pantry items. So God took something that was broken and turned it into something that was beautiful. God tends to do this. He does it with our lives. He does it with the brokenness that we have. And, but we, however, tend to do the exact opposite. We tend to take something that's beautiful and turn it into something that's broken. You know, I've done a lot of weddings uh, over the years as I've been serving as pastor and uh, some beautiful weddings in our sanctuary. We, I've had a couple weddings at the beach. I even did a wedding on a yacht in Key West. They're all beautiful, gorgeous. But, you know, sometimes I can't help but thinking, thinking that statistically, half of those weddings that I have performed are going to end in brokenness. And brokenness in our lives can take all different forms. We uh, tend to get overscheduled, right? We have too many things going on. We're running here and there. We don't have time for God, time for ourselves to rest, time for our uh, kids, and time to dedicate to our spouses. Even our jobs can become broken if maybe we're uh, not gelling with our boss, not getting along, or, or if uh, our, our careers seem to have stalled out, or if uh, you know, our work becomes kind of a drudgery. Our bodies can become broken through illness, injury, and even age, and even our hearts can become broken. You know, every time we lose something in our lives that's important to us, we go through a grieving process, be it a person who passes away, a relationship lost, maybe we lose a house to foreclosure, or we lose a pet that we loved. You know, we we actually grieve in our lives a lot more than we even realize Every time we have something that is important to us that is taken away, we go through this grieving process. You know, um, last uh, October, uh, the Cardinals were in the World Series. Now, I had been cheering the Cardinals baseball team all season long. I'm a big Cardinals fan, and they finally get to the World Series, and then, of course, they lose to the Boston Red Sox. The week following, I was kind of crabby and depressed, and finally I realized I was grieving the loss of something that was very important in my life. And of course, 
you know, we go through that process. No matter what team we're rooting for, no matter what it is in our life that was taken away, we go through this brokenness. You know, but when things in our lives are broken, we try to fix them, right, to varying uh, results. If we have burnout, then maybe we try to cut back on the things that we're doing. Maybe we try to uh, join a gym so that we can have more energy or take a vacation that we could get away and reconnect with our family. You know, if our jobs become broken, we might uh, get our resumes out there and just kind of see what else is out there. Or we might go back to school and get some uh, new education. When our bodies become broken, we might try to eat better, take medication. Sometimes it requires surgery or we take some vitamins. When our marriage gets broken, we might decide, well, we need to go out on more dates or um, maybe a couple's retreat or maybe even counseling. But, you know, these things uh, that we do to try and fix this brokenness in our lives, sometimes they help and maybe sometimes they don't help. You know, my wife, this past Valentine's Day, she was kind of commenting to me that we've been pretty busy and we haven't really had time to uh, do a lot of things together recently. And she said, you know, I want to do something special for Valentine's Day. And she even commented how she doesn't get flowers like she used to anymore. And so the day before Valentine's Day, I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the flower store and get her some uh, beautiful bouquet, which uh, I picked her up some great flowers. They were gorgeous. And, and so I pulled in next to her car when I got home from work, and I, I saw her car sitting there, and I said, you know it would be great if tomorrow on Valentine's Day, when she got into her car to go to work, she would see a beautiful bouquet of flowers sitting on her seat. Now, of course, we had kind of an unseasonably warm February this year, <laughs> but I thought, no, they'll be okay overnight. You know, it cools down enough that they should be fine. So I put the flowers on her driver's seat, and I'm all excited to, uh, you know, have her find them in the morning. So about 10 o'clock the next morning then, I'm at work and I get a text. Are you mad at me? (laughs) And I said, no, why would you ask that? And she said, well, why would you put dead and wilted flowers in my car? (laughs) They didn't hold up like I would have hoped. (laughs) So the things that we do to try and fix our lives, you know, don't always work. Sometimes the brokenness is pervasive no matter what we try and do to fix it. But Christ at the center of our lives can fix our brokenness permanently and for eternity. How many of you are familiar with the comedian Jim Gaffigan? You know who he is? You may have heard this uh, this one comedy bit that he does where he kind of talks about some weird traditions that we have at Easter time. He says, Easter, the day Jesus rose from the dead, what should we do? How about eggs? Well, what does that have to do with Jesus? I don't know, we'll hide them. I don't follow your logic. Don't worry, there's a bunny. He says that these things don't seem to have any sort of connection. We just do these weird traditions to celebrate Easter. But in fact, they all do have an important connection. They are all illustrations of how the brokenness of the tomb becomes beautiful in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about it for a second. We have uh, bunnies and flowers that are symbols of Easter And they're both symbols of springtime, right? When nature, which is dead in winter, receives new life, just as Christ did in the tomb. And then we have uh, butterflies and eggs, which are also symbols of Easter. Both start out with something that looks dead, right? A cocoon or an egg that is representative of the tomb, which is broken open, that new life might abound. These are reminders to us of how God makes broken things beautiful, And so in Easter then, Jesus changes the tomb from a symbol of death into a symbol of life and victory. If you see uh, a picture of a tomb with a stone rolled away, you don't think that there's death in there. You think that it's a picture of Christ's resurrection from the dead. You know, Jesus also takes Easter and he makes the cross from an instrument of execution and torture into a sign of victory and life once again. So uh, what would you think of a church if they displayed prominently, as this cross is, uh, a noose or a guillotine, an, an object of execution? But we don't think of that when we see the cross because in Christ's victory, he has turned this into the symbol of our eternal life, a symbol of how much God loves us, how eager he is to give us the forgiveness of sin and grace in him. So then, how can resurrection help each and every one of us with our brokenness? 
Well, God can take our hurt and pain and make something beautiful out of it through our risen Savior. If you take a look at our gospel text for today, you have uh, three people there in the gospel of John that are all broken on Easter morning, right? You have Mary, she goes to the tomb. She's expecting to find the body of Jesus that she might prepare him for burial. And uh, instead of finding him there, she finds that he has risen from the dead. She finds an empty tomb, but she doesn't understand that right away, right? She's grief-stricken. She's crying. She's asking people, where is the Lord? So she goes back and tells the disciples. Then the text said that John and Peter go running for the tomb. I always think it's funny that this is John's gospel, and he makes a special point of saying that he beat Peter to the tomb as though he's rubbing it in a little bit, that he's faster, but then he says, Peter goes in and he sees that the tomb is empty. And we know from other accounts that they encounter angels that proclaim that Jesus has risen from the dead. And then John goes in and sees the same thing. And our text says that they finally believe their grief, their distress, their turmoil, their brokenness then turns into joy and peace and resurrection and life. But then Mary, uh, who is still looking for Jesus, uh, looks in and sees that the tomb is empty. Then she kind of sees someone out of the corner of her eye, but at first she thinks it's the gardener. So she says, please tell me where you have taken him that I might go to him. And Jesus just says one word, Mary. And she finally realizes that that is Jesus and that he is alive. And in that moment, all of her brokenness once again turns to something beautiful, that joy that comes through knowing Christ. Their brokenness was made beautiful on Easter morning, and so can ours through a meaningful encounter with Jesus. You know, we can have a meaningful encounter with Jesus through worship, through prayer, through reading the Bible, through being with other Christians who can encourage us and love us and uplift us. But in the end, these encounters will only be meaningful if we allow Jesus to influence us. It doesn't help us to go to worship if when we walk out the door, we haven't allowed Jesus to touch our hearts, if we haven't allowed the Spirit to influence our lives. It doesn't help if we refuse the Spirit of God to change us, and if we refuse to change, then nothing in our life will change. But when we allow Jesus to influence our lives, then we begin our journey from broken to beautiful. Here's an example. A man by the name of Brett Weber was going through uh, law school. And while he was in law school, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, a, a very um, a severe form, aggressive form. And uh, very quickly, he was bound to a wheelchair, and his, his hands became very crippled, and he couldn't finish law school. So instead of doing that, he began painting. He began painting these beautiful depictions, abstract depictions in his mind of his brokenness becoming beautiful in Christ. You know, uh, artists then, be, um, and the people in the art world kind of got to um, take notice of his beautiful paintings and began to ask him to show them in different art galleries. And now his paintings are all over the world in very prestigious art galleries, including uh, one in Soho, Manhattan, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Allentown, Denver, and even cities in Israel and in Greece as people have come to see the beauty in his paintings. He even then started his own art gallery called Broken Art Gallery. You know, Brett writes in his blog on the internet that he's always trying to follow God's plan for his life. He is always exploring three ideas that have helped him manage his MS in a positive way. Simply having faith in Christ, staying creative, and finding true companionship and friends. He credits his Lord for turning his brokenness into something beautiful. So let me ask you, whatever brokenness is in your life, whatever you struggle with, is it greater than Brett's? Because his is an example that God can take any brokenness and make it beautiful again in Jesus Christ. God took Brett's MS and turned it into beautiful art and gave him a wonderful testimony to share in Jesus Christ that he influenced his life and he can influence our life too, just as powerfully as he influenced Brett's if we would only allow him to do so. You know, Jesus wants to make a difference in your life today and every day for all eternity. But ultimately, you know, our bodies are temporary. They do break down. Eventually, 
our bodies will become broken and give out. But praise be to God that he raised Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Not that he would be the last to be raised from the dead, but he would be the first that he would be proof to all of us that God has power over death and life through the gift of the cross. His resurrection is our assurance and hope that we will be resurrected as well. And we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit in our baptism that is a down payment on that eternity that we have already received. God is saying, your salvation is so sure, I'm going to mark it with my Holy Spirit on your heart. He gives us that promise so that we too could be raised and spend eternity with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you that on this morning you took the brokenness of Christ and raised him from the dead. That the tomb would no longer be a symbol of death, nor the cross be a symbol of execution, but that they would remind us of the victory, the total victory that Jesus has had over death, and that he gives it to us as a free gift for your mercy and grace. We ask that you would remind us each day of that mercy in our lives, that we would open our hearts and allow you to influence us, Lord. Allow you to take our brokenness and turn it into something beautiful. We ask that you would remind us each day of your love and calling on our lives, that from our marriage to our jobs to everything that we have in our lives, that they would glorify you and that they would reflect that beauty of your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite you to stand and pray with me the prayer that our Lord has taught us with the words that are on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.